Well, welcome everyone to this August session of Reading Pilgrimage Together. This month, we will be talking about two volumes, uh, but fortunately they're short and they offer an interesting contrast when you look at the two of them uh, together. We'll be talking about The Trap, uh, which is when Miriam uh, takes a roommate and goes through this roommate experience and uh, finds out what she thinks about that. And then Oberland, which uh, is based on a trip that Dorothy Richardson made to Switzerland. And uh, we get a much, uh, this is the one uh, uh, book in which essentially everyone but Miriam is new to us. Uh, so uh, that's another interesting aspect of the book. So, and we're very uh, privileged today to have as our special guest, Dr. Bryony Randall from the University of Glasgow. Uh, Bryony is actually the editor for the volume of the Oxford edition of Richardson that includes the trap or will include the trap when it uh, comes out. So I, I think we've got as close to uh, uh, the kind of uh, er source of trap experience and knowledge that we could find. So uh, let me just uh, quickly go through the administrative aspects uh, just as a reminder of where we are. So we've been, uh, a lot of folks have been uh, coordinating and, and responding and sharing thoughts to you through Twitter using the pilgrimage together hashtag. And please, if you, if you want to share something on Twitter, that's a great way to do it and make sure everybody gets it. Uh, that's also being picked up and fed to the feed on the right hand side of the reading pilgrimage site. So uh, if you're, even if you're not on Twitter, Twitter you can follow uh, the discussions through that. Uh, we've been meeting since January. So, uh, and this is an interesting point. Not only do we have two quite different books, but we're moving from volume three to volume four. So we've got, uh, I've got my, my two here. Uh, I'm very lucky to have a dent edition, which is wonderful. Um, and just looking ahead, uh, we've lined up the schedule through uh, uh, for the next three volumes after this. So in September, we have Dr. Chris Rainwater uh, from the University of Macon in Georgia uh, joining us to talk about Dawn's Left Hand. Uh, in, we're gonna do this actually after the 31st uh, since uh, the week, the last full week in October is half term week for school, those with school kids in the UK. So we're gonna delay that and uh, on the 2nd of November, we're going to talk about Clear Horizon with Max Saunders, who's joined us for a number of these discussions. At the end of November, we'll be talking about Dimple Hill with Dr. Annika Lindskog uh, from Sweden, who has recently written on Richardson for the Richardson Society Journal. And then finally, the plan for the last session uh, dealing with March Midnight, which will be kind of a uh, a roundup session. We're going to try to do that in January and kind of bring in as many of the Richardson scholars who have participated as possible to kind of have a mass discussion. So that might be an extra long one. So today we're going to talk about The Trap, uh, which is book eight, published in April 25, and then Oberland, which was published in November of 27. And again, at, if at any point people have questions about these things, you're welcome to ask me. There is an email address associated with the uh, Reading Pilgrimage site. Uh, so with that, let me ha happily uh, welcome Bryony and uh, turn it over to offer a few remarks. I'll remind that Bryony did uh, uh, felt like we should share a few red, red passages out of the book. So I'll just mention that Karen Horowitz has kindly offered to uh, read the passage from the trap, but we're still looking for a volunteer if we get around to the passage from Oberland to, for somebody to jump in and, and read that for us. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Bryony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brad, and, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be in a room with, in a room with so, so many Richardsonians, um, and I'm really interested to hear what you've made of these. Um, 
of these chapter chapter volumes um i what i've got is about 10 minutes of um some quite oh, various yeah. thoughts on each uh chapter volume um and i'm kind of really? referring at one or another moment to the um sections that i thought we might focus on so uh maybe reading them out might be something would hap happen um after I've, after i've said my introductory um comments um if that's if that works okay so we were just right now we we're just dis discussing as uh, when i first arrived before everybody came in how um how contrasting these chapter volumes are in many ways obviously one thoroughly urban as we're used to many of these um, chapter volumes set entirely in london and one in a completely different geographical context and as is of course as we uh, are now familiar with um, with Richardson, no explanation of the transition from the one to the other, except as gradually emerges, we, we discern that um, Miriam has been advised to go on holiday as a result of it, sort of nervous exhaustion owing to a work it would seem. Um, they're both they're both short and I did also notice one interesting structural similarity in that each, you might have noticed this too, each has a very short penultimate chapter. Penultimate chapter is, you know, a couple of paragraphs, but quite different in, in terms of their content. So one has more of a narrative function, and that is in Oberland and in the, in the trap, it's really hi highly lyrical and highly poetic. So I'm going to pick out some elements of each book I found most interesting, but obviously I hope the conversation will be very free and open. A couple of words maybe on the passages I've chosen, why I've chosen them. Now they're both from the first chapter at, of each book, uh, uh, and each offers Miriam's first perceptions of a, of a room, a, a bedroom, or other kind of dwelling room. Um, everyone will have noticed how crucial light is, and I'm sure it may have come up in previous discussions, how crucial light is in Miriam's aesthetic, philosophical, phenomenological development. It's an absolutely kind of crucial indicator of, of her experience and how she can orientate herself, particularly in a new space. Um, but I, I, I noticed as well other senses that came into play. In the trap, smell seems to be an important sense that comes into play in orientating her in this new space. In Oberland, temperature is really, really significant. Um, uh, and, and even also flavour. I mean, I, I don't think it's literal flavour, but the, the kind of language of vocabulary of flavour is used. So it made me think about how intensely Richardson uses the language of, sen of the senses to, um, to show how Miriam orientates herself and to help us orientate Miriam in a space. And, and then when I was thinking about orientation, as sort of as an aside, when I was reading the first dinner scene in Oberland, when, when Miriam goes down to dinner a little bit, a bit disorientated herself, and um, it struck me as a very Richardsonian gesture that she, there's a, what appears to be a very precise description of exactly who's sitting where behind next, next to the window and then next to them. And, and it sort of made me want to draw a seating plan, but I'm not sure actually whether that would either be possible or of course the point. So you're drawn into um, wanting to experience this as absolutely precise and, um, and, and replicable. But in fact, I think where one's tried to do it, the filter through Miriam's um, perception means it, it wouldn't actually be possible. Um, just one thing to say about how Richardson articulates visual perceptions in particular and, and, and particularly the role of light. Um, I've said something in a recent publication, which I can plug for you here, called Modernist Intimacies. Um, I have an article in there on, on Richardson, and I've said something there about um, Clive Bell's theory of significant form. You, you, you will um, you may have heard of Clive Bell, the art critic, brother-in-law of, of um, Virginia Woolf, and he had an, an interesting, very, very um, influential theory of significant form, um, which, might be an interesting context to think about the way in which Richardson is articulating uh, the relationship with light and, and surfaces in, in the trap. Um, and, uh, and as I say, when we get to the passages I've mentioned, there is one particular sentence which begins, long has she stood, at which is syntactically extremely peculiar even for Richardson. So one thing we might want to do is ask ourselves, where is Miriam temporally and spatially in that 
uh, sentence and then I guess arguably therefore where, where is where is the reader. So what I'm going to do now, if, if this is all right, is to say a little bit about more about the trap and then a little bit about Oberlin. So focusing on the trap, um, George Thompson, the great annotator of, of Richardson, to whom we are most indebted, uh, says that the trap is Richardson's most explicit, explicitly thematic chapter volume. He talks about being a, it being a one where she considers um, uh, the life of the world, as it were, being a hostess and, and particularly being a wife and eventually finds that wanting. The novel certainly has frequent reflections on relationships between men and women and she's evidently weighing up what marriage to Densley would be like. But it's also worth not noticing the language that's used about her arrangement with Miss Holland, never Selina. Now she says, I could never bring myself to call her Selina, very notable, but it's explicitly described as a marriage of convenience. Um, and Miriam casts herself as the husband in this arrangement often thinking as we're familiar again as really engaging with her sense that sense of herself as playing a male role so that's one striking aspect of the way in which um richardson's investigating the notion of marriage in this um chapter volume um another um really important moment in this in this in fact in all of pilgrimage for me is um towards the end of the novel where she has a realization and she's having a conversation with Miss uh, Mrs. Cameron. Um, uh, and, and Mrs. Cameron, this very kind of ordinary straightforward woman, gives her what in another context we might call an epiphanic moment. So Miriam says, this scene that she persisted in seeing as background stationary, not moving on, was her life was counting off years. This seems to me very much what, you know, what we're always told about with mindfulness and well-being. It's about now, this is it. Only the present is, is real. And in other types of narrative, this might then be dwelt on and we might have some reflection on Miriam couldn't believe that she'd never felt, felt this before and how significant this is going to be for the rest of her life. Um, but here immediately we get Eve the maid comes in and any explicit, so this, she's then distracted by what Eve is doing, and any explicit reflection on this moment doesn't actually happen. Um, I think arguably there's allusion to it right, right at the end of the, of the trap. Uh, she talks about the joy of feeling ready to take responsibility for oneself. I must create my life. So there's something there about the sort of grasping of, of now, of the moment, this is my life. But it, it, it's interesting in relation to, there's a, a familiar notion in modernist literary criticism of, of the epiphany as a kind of key uh, literary figure of in particularly in Joyce, but also in Wolf, arguably in some elements of Ford, Maddox Ford, that this epiphanic moment that is somehow life-changing, dramatic, and, and around which an entire text coalesces. In this instance, Richardson provides us with a version in which, uh, I mean, more realistically, arguably fallible as we are, epiphanies do not immediately change our lives. We forget them, we fail to act on them. They only partially or gradually start to actually affect how we behave and feel. So, so what might in, in another context be um, so, sort of built up textually is, 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 slid, is slid over and only gradually appears to be integrated in, um, uh, if at all, in, in Miriam's later development. It's very, uh, very much that fragmentary fits and starts development that is so characteristic of, of uh, how Miriam's depicted. And then a couple of things that struck me on reading Oberland, which it indeed is a text I know less well, knowing the chat very well indeed. Um, I mean, the, the terms I wrote down are internationalization and globalization. As Brad said, um, these are all Bar Barmerian characters who we've never met before, and they're from many different countries. Um, Miriam's instinct to categorize them by her national by nationality, uh, and in particular, her miscategorization of the Russian who is in fact Italian, I can't help but feel is, is um, a moment of, of Richardson's gentle satire of her protagonist. Um, although, of course, it's a, a gesture, it's, a, it's a, an instinct which, with which, of course, many of us might feel familiar in, in finding ourselves in an international setting. But as well as that kind of obvious international setting, uh, the theme of, 
consumption and what we might now call globalization is very vivid when she goes to buy uh, goes to the shops wanting the full foreign experience and is disappointed to see all the brands she's familiar with at home and of course now this is this is absolutely intrinsic to kind of all, almost all travel experiences and we many you know many people desperately seek finding a place on the globe where they don't see a coca-cola sign um but it, it was striking how how early then if we're imagining this as what is it set in 1904 or five something like that how how early that that experience is is recorded and then uh, i overland also contains one of my very favorite passages in pilgrimage which is what i call the soap passage <laughs> one of my absolute favorites it's an example of one of the many times um in pilgrimage where some inanimate object speaks to Miriam of something really existential. Um, and this particular passage is an insight into how she experiences time, because uh, you'll remember what she says there when she has this you know, moment of revelation, uh, as it were, some kind of um, mediated epiphany. All great days had soap, so all days have soap in them. But also, she says, to buy a new cake of soap is to buy a fresh stretch of days. So soap has days in it. Um, now, uh, uh, that this is couched in terms of days is very significant to me. So I haven't particularly drawn this out here, but second plug coming up. I refer you to my book, Modernism, Daily Time and Everyday Life. Should you wish to find out more about what I have to say about Richardson and days. Um, but it's also an example that you find frequently in Richardson of casting of, of time as space. So that a soap contains, a bar of soap contains days. In, in the trap, we've got her floating off into her day, as if it were a room, the wide, deep spaces of a London Sunday morning. So this interesting invocation of, of time with space. And then the last thing I wanted to say about Oberland is how, how thrilling it really was to read a passage of just fun, of pure fun, um, in the, the particularly the tobogganing passage. And then she reflects on it a little bit about what games have. And that's another actually, it struck, it's just a handbook to well-being, this woman, but it struck me that's another thing that we're often um, encouraged to think about. Where in our lives can we have something that is just for, simply for the sake of its, for its own sake, for pleasure, for fun? Uh, for enjoyment. Um, it, it, it's interesting that she says uh, it's a little bit like cycling in traffic because I think something similar happens when she experiences cycling for the first time with Mag and Jan. I mean, Mag and Jan are the places where all the fun stuff happens anyway, right? They're, 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 um, they're the locus of fun. Um, but uh, the description in Oberland of that pure physical sensation of, of kind of fear and joy and um, kind of an overwhelming sensory experience is, is in, super striking, I think really striking aspect of, of this novel. So those were the, the elements that I thought I that jumped out to me, um, but I'm uh, very happy, of course, to hear what everybody has to say, and I hope some of those thoughts have, have chimed with your own or prompted further, further reflections. Well, thank you so much, Bryony. I, I, uh, <laughs> I was scribbling down lots of notes uh, in the course of that discussion, so I think I think we'll have plenty of folks interested in jumping in with questions. Uh, I, I love that. I mean, uh, you know, uh, one of my my dreams is, you know, Alain de Botan has written this book called How, How Proofs Can uh, Improve Your Life or something like that. And I, I have this vision of writing, uh, you know, how pilgrimage can improve your life, but I've never, never heard anybody say that it's a guy handbook to well-being. <laughs> That's it. She's or mindfulness. It. I mean, my gosh, somebody should write about Dorothy Richardson, Miriam, and mindfulness because talk about somebody who really did immerse herself in trying to be in the moment. Uh, I, I think one would do have a be hard pressed to find uh, someone who took that to such lengths as Richardson did. Yeah. Um, before we start with discussions, though, uh, you did mention that the, about having a passage or two read, and I think that's a great idea because it does help to remind us 
of Richardson's language. Uh, Karen, as I mentioned, has volunteered. I was incorrect. I thought she had volunteered for the trap, but it was actually Oberlin. But we can do either one as, as you wish. Um, and, uh, and, and let's, if, if Karen, if you're willing to, uh, to pick up uh, one and, and let's, let's go with Oberlin if you're ready to do that one. Uh, okay. And, yeah, I'm uh, ready for both now, Brad. So whichever you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's go with Oberlin since that's what I what you actually agreed to do. Okay, that is great. So this is page 33 in Oberlin. Yes. Right. Okay. When the door was at last blessedly closed upon the narrow room, whose first statements miscarried, lost in the discovery that even up here. There was no change in the baked, dry air. She made for the cool light of the end window, but found in its neighborhood not only no lessening, but an increase of the oppressive warmth. The window was a door giving onto a little balcony whose wooden paling hid the floor of the valley and the bases of the great mountains across the way. The mountains were now bleak, white, patched and streaked with black, and as she stood still, gazing at them, sat there arrested and motionless, and holding before her eyes an unthinkable gray bitterness of cold, she found a new quality in her fast closed windows and the exaggerated warmth. Though still oppressive, they were triumphant also, speaking a knowledge and a defiance of the uttermost possibilities of cold. Cold was banished by day and by night. For a fortnight, taken from the rawest depths of the London winter, there would be no waste of life in mere endurance. She discovered the source of the stable warmth in an unsightly row of pipes at the side of the large window bent over like hairpins and scorching to the touch. The concentrated heat revived her weary nerves. At the end of the coil, there was a regulator. Turning it, she found the heat of the pipes diminish and hurriedly reversed the movement and glanced out at the frozen world and loved the staunch metallic warmth and the flavor of timber added to it in this room whose walls and furniture were all of naked wood. Turning to it in greeting, she found it seem less small. It was small, but made spacious by light. Light came from a second window that was now calling, a small square beside the bed with the high astonishing smooth billow of covering, oddly encased in thin sprigged cotton offering mountains not yet seen. The way to it was endless across the short room from whose four quarters there streamed, as she moved, a joy so deep that she brought up opposite the window as if on another day of life and glanced out carelessly at a distant group of pinnacles darkening in a twilight that was not gray, but lit wanly in its fading by snow. Thank you so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Karen. Because uh, there's a lot just in that passage. There's a lot to pick up on, isn't there? First yeah. of all, how how many of you have ever uh, vacationed in the winter in uh, either Switzerland or Austria or Germany in one of these uh, hotels with the bare pine? Uh, I mean, if you've ever stayed in a hotel, we we used to ski in a little town called Surfhaus in. Um, Austria, uh, and it was a hotel that was like that. All the rooms were these bare pine uh, walls, uh, superheated as they <laughs> as they tend to. You walk in, and there's this blast of of air, a uh, hot uh, of heat that comes off of the radiators. Uh, so for me, that was just oh my gosh, I was right back in those places. You smell kind of the the resiny smell of the bare pine uh, 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 walls and the furniture. Uh, but also light and how the mountains and the, the different light as, as Miriam sees the light. And there's that wonderful moment 
right at the end when Mrs. Harcourt it kind of bangs uh, on the wall from the next room and says, look at the mountains, uh, effectively. Uh, and since uh, as uh, when back when we had our session in May uh, with the folks in, in uh, Australia, it was pointed out how often the word radiance uh, plays a key role. And uh, Overland in particular is full of a lot of radiance, that's for sure. So uh, with, I, I just wanna, let's open it up uh, for discussion. Anyone who wants to, if you wanna raise your hand uh, in Zoom or you just wanna chime on in with a question. Um, but if, if it's okay, I'd like to start by asking Bryony one at, cause you brought this up about the brief penultimate chapters. And one thing that fascinates me as I'm going through uh, pilgrimage again is the role that um, chapter length plays because Richardson has these you know, 40, 50 page chapters, like I think the first chapter in the tunnel is one of these. And then she's got ones that are not even a paragraph, so to speak. Uh, and, and you have uh, books where there are, you know, many, many chapters, 30 plus chapters, I think in, uh, I wanna say either Honeycomb, uh, but, uh, and then others where they're just, you know, really about 10 or so. And I, I noticed that particularly because I'm writing these plot synopses pieces on the website. And so I, I pay attention to how many chapters there are. Has there been anybody, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about how Richardson, I mean, there's been a, a fair amount of stuff written about her sentences, but what about her chapters? That's a really good question. I don't, uh, I, I don't know of, um, I can't off the top of my head think of work that's been done on her chapters, but I think that's a really great observation. When I started reading Oberland, I started thinking, oh, I think these chapters are going to be longer. And then it, and then it turns out there's actually a similar number of chapters. It, it, for me, um, it kind of, um, it goes hand in hand, I think, to some extent with the way in which Richardson feels free to, really changed no I mean I wouldn't say cha exactly change change style but to move in uh, in terms of almost the genre or the, or the kind of aspect of the narrative she's focusing on so so she feels free to have um like in the trap a chapter which is effectively like a kind of like a, a free verse poem really um and chapters that are almost all dialogue then but then she and then something like that I mean that wonderful is again I mean you know one of my absolute favorites the, cha the chapter in the tunnel which is actually very very descriptive just almost purely descriptive with these moments of her own interiority so that um, it's like her not feeling constrained um, by syntax or often by punctuation, um, not feeling constrained by, by, by chapter length. Um, and it's, it, it, the question of chapters is, is also, uh, and how chapters work um, as a kind of signifier, as a signifier of meaning. There's definitely been you know, work done, done on Wolf, who I know about, for example, um, Mrs. Dalloway, where there's a there's a interesting editorial history about how a chapter break was lost, so it was always intended to be twelve chapters, which is quite significant for the kind of daily pattern of it. Um, but I think that's a really interesting point. So you know, note note for a project for somebody there. <laughs> but it's, it must be. I mean, it it totally fits, doesn't it, with all the kind of freedoms that she she permits herself and insists on, really. Yeah. Yeah, I just was wondering if there maybe was any relationship with just, you know, how her process of composing the book, if, you know, sometimes uh, she had the time <laughs> to write a long chapter. And... Could, could be, but I, but I think, um, but not... <laughs> it's not what springs to mind to be honest my sense is that the form very much follows the the flow of 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 whatever it is this particular unit of unit of meaning or or uh, what wants to say right right yeah. well does anybody out there uh, have a question they, they want to bring up and uh, or uh, offer up as a we i see karen you've got your hand raised yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, one was I just wanted to offer the um, sort of experiential reflection that 
I find when I read passages from uh, Richardson, any any of the books aloud, um, I feel I have a different, ex- a completely different experience than when I'm reading it internally. Um, and it, it, it's, it sort of helps me stay with it. So talking about the mindfulness <laughs> and the being there in the moment, it, it really, really feels much more available in that way. So I find that really interesting. I mean, I don't have time personally to read all of this aloud, <laughs> but every time I do read a passage, I just feel, oh yeah, I'm really there with it in a different way. So I think there could be something interesting to another research project there for somebody to do. Um, but the question I, I, I have for Brian and anybody else who maybe has been tracking this is around this repeated motif of Miriam, um, it's often going upstairs into her room, her space, and then the vista from the window. And sometimes the vista from the window is, at least in my um, kind of impressionistic memory of it all, it's quite grimy or it's rooftops and there's dirt or there's something, but this space is so precious for her to be able to come back to from the world. And when you were talking about the epiphanies, um, I connect her being in the room and the importance of the windows and the vistas with the epiphanies. So there's the external view and the internal view. And I just wondered if, does that happen in every uh, chapter or volume of pilgrimage? Or, you know, I don't know if anyone's tracked that, but it certainly happens more than once. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very good question. I think that's right now. I'd, I I couldn't. I'm trying to think back through uh, the other uh, the other chapter volumes, but I think that I've, my sense that that is absolutely a, a highly characteristic event, and I it kind of um, certainly with the the place she's in the boarding house before she's in the place she's in in the trap. You know that room. Uh, you know, with yes. all its kind of failings and impoverishment it becomes so crucial to her as this place of safety and, and I mean you could do all kinds of things with a kind of um, metaphorization of her interiority in the outside world and how much Miriam's Miriam's interiority is you know she's she's a little bit sort of um not narcissistic but she's a, she's she's very concerned about herself she's young you know um and that that, that these rooms are also part of that but I, it's part of what I find so um you know again rereading these is what's so um it's more than charming it's kind of you know affirming is her capacity for absolute delirious delight and ecstasy in the room her room just in her room um and and that um uh that the and, and and it's partly as well i mean what 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 overlays that is the which really came through with your beautiful reading of this passage is the care and attention that, that Richardson, Richardson's narrative pays to it. So yes, we are, yes, I am going to describe exactly what this radiator looks like. I'm going to tell you exactly what it looks like and what happens at the end of the coil and what you have to, yes, you know, sorry, <laughs> because that is, and particularly when it's a new space, that is mm. what, you know, yeah. this is, sense that this is we 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 explore uh, with every kind of sense Uh, and and so Richardson is also saying yes these are this is life (laughs) you know as it were this is um uh, these things that repay kind of careful attention so yeah thank you a couple of uh points are being made in the chat uh first uh and uh, we discussed this uh in our session in July uh, and I noticed both the trap and Oberlin feature moments where the voice changes abruptly from third to first and then back. And, uh, you know, I I didn't really tune into that until I think revolving lights, Uh, but, you know, it's probably happens before and and now we'll all be looking for it from here on. Uh, any, Any thoughts about why, I mean, why, why did she do that? And what was she trying to do? I can, I can tell you that if anybody wants to look into this, a, a PhD student of mine called Gemma Elliott 
wrote a PhD which in, included, I mean, you, it wasn't a comprehensive analysis of the first and third persons, but it, it, it looked at that in some in some detail. So if you want to look up the University of Glasgow thesis, uh, Gemma Elliott, I couldn't tell you the title of the, of the thesis. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's in a sense the, um, the unmarkedness of that shift that's interesting, isn't it? The fact that it's not first person and then we have a break and then we've moved to third. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it just feels very much like it's a, um, and something organic that it's hard to, I think, I mean, from speaking for myself personally, I think it's hard to map exactly where, where the first person is, except that we said, except we might feel it's particularly interior, but I don't even know if that's really the case. To be honest. There seem to be moments of relatively intense experience. I know the first time I caught it, I think she's riding the bicycle uh, back into London and it's, you know, if you love riding a bicycle, especially if you're going downhill, as she would have coming from the north of London into the center yes. of town, that's such a, a thrill. And of course, the traffic growing and all that. So it's it's quite an intense experience. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that at least when she did it in Oberlin, it was kind of like that was going on. It was almost like she was going into overdrive in terms of the intensity of how she was experiencing. Yeah. Uh, Max, you have your hand raised and I have another question from uh, from the group on the chat. Yeah, thanks. Just to um, sort of add a comment to that question about persons. I, I, I um, was very struck at the beginning of the next book, Dawn's Left Hand, because um, I'm feeling really smug this week, having actually caught up and, and even got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, that, uh, I mean, when she says, um, I mean, this is about, um, is it about hypo? I think it must be, I can't remember. Um, he would understand that discovery about oneself is impersonal as well as personal, like a discovery in chemistry, um, uh, which, which is great, isn't it? And, I, and you know, those, those moments of, of the sort of flipping of, of the person from first to third and back do, do feel a bit like that to me, where, you know, something you, you've thought of as seen from outside and impersonal personal suddenly switches into the first person. That's a great point. I mean, I, for myself, have to say the most frightening, frightening moments of self-revelation do feel like a third person is saying, you realize you're doing this. <laughs> uh, a couple of folks are, uh, have asked a question about, um, and that's going back to the trap, uh, Miriam's motivation for taking, of sharing a room particularly with a woman that she barely knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's so the, the, the context for this is very interesting because obviously she's been in what was a, a boarding house where she's provided with, 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 with meals as well. So obviously this is an attempt to um, have a little more independence. Um, it, I mean, it, it, there was a big debate at the time about accommodation for the many or you know many in relation to what have been previously many single working women in in urban areas at, at the time there was this surplus of women um even before the first world war and um it, it was a social concern about what they would would do and so there were um they're worth of people earning even less than Miriam Richardson, sort of more like dormitories or, or, or hostels where women would live, but you know, you didn't get much privacy there and so on. Um, and then to rent an entire flat would be, you'd have to be earning considerably more, considerably more than a dental secretary. So um, it, this, it, it, it certainly is, she puts it an experiment, doesn't she? An experiment in living is, um, it, 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 it's it's far from um, ideal, but it obviously it what she gives up a little bit in terms of privacy of her absolutely her own space. She uh, is 
able to, you know, she gains in those other spaces where she kind of plays out the idea of possibly being able to be a hostess in those in the little back room, which I still like I still after so many times of reading it, I still find it slightly difficult to picture how those spaces um, relate to each other. It's also uh, bringing up the issue about meals going back to, I think, the tunnel uh, where she has a, a visit to Mag and Jan in their rooms and they fix a little soup for her. And she's so amazed at, at this, you know, making soup from uh, powdered uh, uh, materials. And, and that's kind of what she's able to experiment with in her, her shared room. There is at least yeah, one scene which... Yeah, although I think she she does in the early in the early discussion about this, she, that she the agreement is that actually Miss Holland will do a lot of that and there's a discussion about cooking a kipper isn't there about how it's really straightforward right. in Miriam still and and whereas she has to do these much more traditionally masculine things of going and paying the rent right um, the palavering with with them. Um, uh, with the, the landlord that she she finds out she, she really doesn't like but certainly uh, the cooking still seems to be a bit of a myth a mystery to her but the opportunity is there for her to experiment with it certainly. well she wouldn't have had much I mean no giving no, her class background exactly. her family had servants to do those sorts of things and uh, there wasn't a sense, there wasn't, it didn't seem to be part of the culture of that class of that time for mothers to pass on cooking lessons to their daughters. That's right. Yes, it would have been done for them. No women's institute then, I guess. Uh, Phyllis, you had your hand raised. Did you want to uh, uh, raise an issue or a question? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to get back to the, um, well, I think all that's really interesting. And I keep thinking of Mrs. Beaton's book of household management <laughs> and how uh, you could find out everything you could had to do in those days in terms of managing your household. Um, but back to the, the switch of uh, 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 first and third person switch, I see it also as a, um, and I'd like to hear what people think about this, as I find often, and we talked about this the last time, that um, Dorothy is, it's almost a triple narrator, all right? She's got Miriam as a younger version or younger woman. She's got um, Dorothy um, allowing Miriam to age. For instance, in this passage about paying the rent, uh, she goes um, on this sort of long rant about the, the Sheffields, uh, the mocking reflection in the mirror he held up. And then she says, after all, he had a personal life, perplexities. There was nothing in the poor thing to dread. And that shows a little maturity there that Dorothy's saying, okay, Miriam has gotten more mature. But at the same time, Dorothy's, I mean, Dorothy's life is, you know, she's 52, she's been married for eight years. She's pondering some things. And I think sometimes she just kind of, and she also has her little jokes that I think are Dorothy's more than Miriam's. And, and there's just a tension as to, who's talking when, and I think that first and third kind of keeps us on our toes a little bit and, and reminds us of that tension. Yeah, those are they're really great observations. And, and in fact, the PhD thesis that I mentioned to you, but generally it, it, it um, frames the text in a very similar way. Gemma talks about it as a double autobiography very much with autobiography in, in in the scare quotes because we know you know we know how insistent Richardson was in fact I was reading uh, the interview that you put up Brad recently where somebody had gone to interview uh, uh, Dorothy Richardson and she's in the middle she goes it is it's fiction she's absolutely insistent so you know with, with respect to that but nevertheless the proximity to her own life is, is, is um, uh, 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 you can't go past it and I think that's a really those, those observations really really bring that out, yeah. Although, you know, even though it's fiction, she doesn't appear to be rewriting the past, which yeah. would be a, a temptation essentially for, for lesser writers, if you are saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, she so so again, George Thompson is the go to person on this because he does this incredibly meticulous mapping. Now, interestingly, one of the things that he observes is that in, in the, the trap, the trap is the 
if we're thinking of this as, you know, of the raw material of Richardson's life and how she transformed it to fiction, I'm aware that Max, who literally has written the book on this, is here. So, um, but but uh, on the kind of, you know, the the um, uh, fictional autobiography or whatever it was using, using autobiographical material in, in fiction. But the trap is the, according to Thompson, the chapter volume which is most reworked in terms of the kind of chronology and interestingly one of the things that he notes is that in the in the chapter volumes around this time um richardson makes miriam's writing life begin earlier than it did for richardson herself maybe by four or five years so she inserts the moments when when richardson when miriam starts to write is earlier in her life than it was in richardson's but i think you're right i mean there would be many a temptation to to um uh, to cast it in, to cast the, these experiences in a very different light. But that, and again, that might be why she sets, sends off these little discombobulating, disconcerting things. Is to say, no, don't get too step close. Don't don't think you know what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> I'm going to keep you on your toes. You know? Which is what I love about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's interesting. Uh, just to reflect back on uh, when we had Louisa Traeger. Uh, as our guest in, in May, that she pointed out that she had to rework some time frame, some chronological aspects in her own book about Richardson, the, the, the Lodger, to make it because she does approach it as more of a traditional beginning, middle, end narrative that she she kind of rearranged the timing of some things. Um, so for example, uh, what happens in the next book, Dawn's Left Hand, the, the affair with Hypo, the, the, the uh, historically, uh, it, it, that in, in uh, Richard's own life, it didn't necessarily happen at that time frame. And then Trigger herself said, uh, for her novel, she had to kind of reorganize things so that it fit together in a, a book. So a lot of it, I think it's uh, pointing out to, um, us as 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 readers how much structure is a a, a deliberate decision mm -hmm. made uh, by a novelist mm -hmm. yeah no very much so and it come it relates as well to what you you were saying about about chapters you know they these are structured there's you know there's there's form of a form imposed on this on this narrative um yeah and and that actually brings up the point that Oberland, in some ways, is the most neatly structured of all the volumes because it is packaged into that, you know, travel to, yeah. enjoying of, and leaving from uh, her time in Switzerland. Uh, whereas, uh, and particularly if you follow Thompson's chronology, which is in the uh, the Reader's Guide book, unfortunately. These these books are ridiculously expensive and hard to find now, uh, but they're a godsend, and it's just a shame that that uh, there there's good stuff in both of them, but they're not together. <laughs> but this has the chronology where uh, Thompson has carefully tried to work out well this chapter is in this day, etc., and what you see not not really in Oberland. It doesn't happen much in Oberland. It does happen occasionally the trap, it happened a lot in Revolving Lights, which was uh, flashback uh, periods. So you're kind of going in the peasant and then suddenly Miriam is remembering an experience maybe months beforehand. Yeah, yeah, and that the, this is again, a, a, I mean, a feature that was kind of read across much more than this literature, but the present is never just the present. It's, it's never, and, and that, you know, you can move quite rapidly um in, and and seamlessly into those um uh those flashbacks those epilepsies um there's a question in the chat from uh, rebecca about uh just this very specific thing on page 123 of oberland the last paragraph it says in london was hypo held up at any rate saying he was held up and uh, not now so much awaiting her decision as taking it for granted. Was that held up from joining her in Switzerland or? I really hope not. <laughs> Him coming in and spoiling her fun. 
I, I, that's very interesting. I never, I never read it that way. Um, I mean, he's waiting to see if my reading of it has been is that he's waiting to see if 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 she's going to accept his invitation to have an affair. But but the held up is interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I never read it that way. Perhaps just held up in terms of the rendezvous in London. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, given that she has, a, we, we're, well, again, I mean, we're slightly, we're slightly informed here by our knowledge of Richardson's life, but you know, we, we understand that she's effectively been prescribed this break to rest and relax. And I mean, it is interesting how, how much we get a sense of, I mean, they're not, they're not obvious love interests, but it, there's a fairly strong kind of, sort of social erotic kind of connection going on with these these exciting men that that kind of um go around her that she's very vigorously engaged with at least in in terms of debate so you know the fact that hypo is we get this is hypo kind of I, i'm really glad hypo didn't come <laughs> yeah and particularly in 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 uh, overland one gets a sense that she was sort of at least toying with the idea about holding up i mean i as we've discussed throughout these uh sessions there are so many moments where richardson miriam are, are kind of holding up life options and saying you know let me look at these things and she seems to look at Vericker in that way in particular yeah 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 he's he's interesting because he uh on the one hand he looks seems like everything that she kind of disdain but but he's he's in, at every moment seems in, 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 you know incredibly charming and and attractive. So that's abs- I think absolutely, yeah. Although she writes him off in the end, I guess. <laughs> so many of the men she encounters are damned for being men in the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> lesser lesser creatures. Can't, they can't get that beyond it. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons I I think. Uh, personally, I think many men should go through the experience of reading Pilgrimage because <laughs> where else are you going to spend a thousand plus pages seeing the world so insistently through a woman's eyes? Yeah, and and yes, of course, you know, much to the chagrin of of uh, of, of kind of, of many feminist readers that certainly in, maybe in the earlier chapter of volumes, but, but or very often, you know, in Richardson, I think even in, in maybe in the in point of view, says, I hate women, I'm not one, uh, I'm more like a man. And and although that, that happens very early when she's still, you know, she's young, she's just leaving her father, she has a strong kind of uh, attachment to him. It does recur, it recurs in the trap where she casts herself. So, you know, the gender politics are complicated. <laughs> Okay, well, are there any other uh, uh, points or questions? Oh, Max, you've got your hand raised and you've been so polite. So uh, let me, uh, if you can jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, in a way, you've uh, sort of anticipated what I was about to say, talking about life options, because I, I wanted to to take up the, the thread of an earlier discussion, and apologies for those who've heard some of this before, but... Um, but it's about Richardson and the future. I mean, I I really agree with things that have been said tonight. I mean, I like your intro, Brani, and and you know the comments about um, uh, about Richardson being in the moment. But but I think maybe it's because I'm skeptical about mindfulness rather that that, that I wanted to put a, a a different or sort of complementary view at least, which is to say that I've been really struck by how. One of the things she seems to do that I don't see in other writers, certainly not other modernists, is is a real concern with the future in the writing. And I mean, here's a here's a bit again from Dawn's Left Hand when she meets a um, an older woman um, on the platform of the women's group, stately and venerable, ripe with experience, and yet young, still living towards the future. And I can't imagine anyone else writing that sentence. I mean, it's an incredibly long sentence. I just read the end of it. And that's, again, part of the, 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 the shtick, really, that um, you know, you're in the moment of the sentence because it's one of those tortuous German sentences. And it's only when you get to the end, you know what it's been about. Um, but what it's been about is actually living towards the future. 
Yeah. Um, and and my my experience of reading, I mean, I'm sort of obsessed by the future in other things in this period, but but Richardson does seem to be on that wavelength and really sort of thinking not just about the moment and the past, but where it's all heading all the time. And that's a very different sense of temporality, I think, than you get in Wolf or, or, yeah. or, or most other writers, really. That's a really good point. And I've realised, of course, I've said, I've both said, you know, she's right in the moment right there. And I've said the present is never just the present, but <laughs> but the future. The, but what's, uh, but I think also there's, it comes comes across strongly in, in the trap and, and I guess in, um, deadlock beforehand is because her, because her politics are so vivid that it really is a live it's an absolutely live issue what kind of society are we are we moving towards what is the future of you know of politics and and so I think that there's that as well that you that even if it's not explicitly cast in those terms that obviously that's what being involved in politics is about is attempting to have some kind of vision of the future yeah, no, absolutely. But but I think it's even sort of what what her experience is about, because I mean, one of the things that's been, again, sort of really impressing me as one moves on to the book after Oberland is the way Oberland doesn't stay within its own volume, but it becomes a thing that she takes back, you know, and it's not quite clear what that thing is. It's a sort of state of mind or an attitude towards the world or, you know, but it's also a plan for sort of how she wants life to be, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think just to, to say that, and particularly, I mean, Switzerland is a perfect, uh, being in the, in high up in the mountains uh, in the Alps, that's not an experience she would have had any corollary to. I mean, just a visual experience. And um, I know coming from living in Europe uh, for many years and coming here to Montana where I can look out the window right now and see mountains, um, the openness really does expand the mind, I think. It does just give you a sense that, I th it's it's kind of gives you two messages that I find interesting is, and it could be that she was experienced. Uh, number one, you, you're you're just in awe of the size and the dimension, which is a reminder of how little <laughs> we little beings are. But then also, and particularly because in London, you would have seen so much man-made landscape uh, at all turns. But then the other thing is it does give you the sense of possibilities. You know, there are places where there are fewer constraints. So, um, I, I think, you know, going to Switzerland in particular in Oberlin, it, it might have been something, an experience that kind of unlocked uh, the sense of possibilities for her. That might be being too much of a psychiatrist. Uh, we've got some uh, interesting questions in the, in the uh, chat, but uh, Howard Finn has his uh, hand raised. So Howard, if you can uh, jump in and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to add. Uh, yeah, I don't know if my camera's, uh, camera's working or not. Yeah, I just wanted to come back on this discussion of the future. So clearly there is a connection between uh, a woman getting towards her later 20s and all these di different options coming into view and one by one being rejected. Uh, and her politics, the idea of a future in socialism or anarchism. Uh, but the question I wanted to put, um, kind of following on from, from Max in particular, is that I, I very rarely, in fact, almost never get a sense of the actual future. In other words, at the end of pilgrimage, what happens is, 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 the, first world, is the First World War and all the tumultuous events of the 20s, what happens between when Pilgrimage is set and when Richardson is writing. And I just wondered whether anyone had any thoughts about how Richardson seems to avoid um, rewriting her text in relation to some kind of retrospective wisdom about what actually happened. Uh, we could throw in the Russian Revolution and, and other, other events. It's as if she really does go right back to, you know, the 1890s and 1900 and try to write from that perspective rather than rewriting in terms of what, what actually happened historically uh, before, before she started actually writing pilgrimage. Yeah, 
Hi, hello, Howard. Nice to see you. <laughs> That's a question for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great, you've got us all scratching our heads because- well, do, you, do you agree? You know, the first question would be, do you agree? Or do, do you think, aha, uh -huh, I see here how she's setting no, something I, up. Well, I think I do insofar as we're for very, oh God, it's Wolf again, just because I know her best. But I mean, I, we, I'm very familiar with writing a Wolf that will say, of course, this is seen through the filter of, and you know, uh, and, and those, oh no, Jacob's room is obviously, but various, various other texts that, that where, critics are able to discern that kind of the eye of the future on on what's being written about but but I think maybe you're yes you, you're I think you're uh that makes sense to me thinking about my experience of the of the text well she never she may be unique in fact in writing post-war and not foreshadowing the war in anything she writes. I mean, you have various possibilities about the future that she, she thinks about, but at no point do you have the idea that, oh, this is gonna lead to some cataclysm. And, and of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot, I mean, Rebecca West's uh, books about the family. I mean, I uh, forget the, the series, but uh, you know, that's just full of, oh, well, just around the corner, these, this, you know, you're going, to, you're going to run into the First World War. As if anybody knew that. That's uh, <laughs> I wrote that down, Howard, and I, I uh, gosh, what a great question. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, <laughs> to make people scratch their heads. It's just so, as, as you just said, Brad, it's so striking. Almost every other novelist, it's filtered through the First World War and its aftermath. And it, it, I mean, in a sense, it is. It is a in in a sense that this that, that is, of course, we would expect no less. I'm 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 thinking of that great May Sinclair early review of pilgrimage that just expresses it best you know the best I think the best way it's been expressed we can see we can only see or discern anything that Miriam sees or discerns and if Miriam let's face it as a young woman in her mid-20s again she's interested in politics she understands about internationalization because of Michael but really she she's not going to foresee um the first world war so so and 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 with the caveats that we've been talking about about how we we can discern the presence of a narrative voice yes but that narrative voice is still not going to permit itself to to even go so far as to allude to a future or, or that the miriam wouldn't have have anticipated so yeah yeah well oh. it's a reflection of her artistic discipline really isn't it that's that would be my argument and also i think it's it's her defiance of having anyone put her in that position um I, i'm looking at um i don't have the proper pa pagination because i've got an old edition but it's uh in it's the first person passage uh then i am the smallest thing i know there is not a soul i would sacrifice myself for not even michael in his helplessness when i felt that the world must stop to prevent his going to the russian war it was myself I feared to lose. Otherwise, I should want to stop the world for all who go to be killed on battlefields. I do a little, but that may be fear. I, I just think that's she just does not want to be told what to do or think <laughs> about this. She wants to keep it away from her. And of course, the Russian war that she's referring to in that passage is the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. Um, so she's Thank not, you. yeah, Thank she's, you. she's, yeah, she's not, it, she's not thinking great war. She's thinking uh, the war that was going on at that moment. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great, that's just, that's a great passage, isn't it? That's one that I sticks in my mind as well. It's uh, really powerful. I want to throw in another question that was asked earlier in the chat is, uh, is the, is the trap title referring to Miriam's sense of the 
roommate experience or the trap of her conclusions about marriage? Any, any thoughts on that? I think, I mean, I think that, I think it's both together. I think she, she gets some insight into what kind of a trap marriage would be through this domestic arrangement with, with Miss Holland. I mean, it's, um, it's a, it's a quite a striking, yeah, exactly. I mean, that certainly, I think it is the trap of having that, that roommate, but in a sense, it, you know, there's the bit towards the end where, um, one of one of Celine, Selena Holland's previous roommates comes to visit, and they have they took to, to reminisce about how wonderful it was and how well they got on, and how, you know maybe they just weren't simpatico. But but one sense is that this 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 kind of arrangement is not going to work for Miriam, and yeah. you know it's that intimacy with one other person, and so that she, in her language about it as a marriage of convenience, it helps her to 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 think about how that kind of intimacy might be comparable to the intimacy of marriage and how that probably isn't going to work either it's a very striking title the trap i'm thinking about the various other titles which either describe uh, well i mean I, they're very varied aren't they the titles in what they do oberlin's very just you know sort of um, simple and straightforward but the trap is it, it asks us to to read that obviously metaphorically um, uh, just want to uh, Mark uh, Alexander uh, brought up a quote uh, relevant to the, the last discussion uh, from Oberlin. Michael's certainty that everyone in the world is marching to annihilation. But that's probably more in the sense of the nihilist revolutionary spirit that was coming out of Russia from the really the late 19th century. Uh, actually, the the spirit that was going was strongly prevalent up until the uh, unsuccessful road of revolts of uh, 1905. Uh, so like Lenin's brother who was uh, uh, tried and executed in the, in the attempt on the czar's life, assassination of uh, Alexander III, I think. Um, I mean, they, they were, sort of nihilists. I mean, they, they they kind of declared themselves nihilists. And uh, I think the devils in uh, the Dostoevsky novel, the devils is also that spirit of... So I, I when I read that, I, I was thinking Russian nihilism, not foreshadowing of World War I. I hope that's a not inaccurate interpretation. But that's another perfect great exercise for some scholars to go through pilgrimage and find out, does she in fact foreshadow anything or not? And uh, it doesn't seem to be the case, at least in my, my reading it. I do remember a passage where she is, I, I don't, it's a couple of volumes ago where she has one of her people that she's arguing politics with say, there's going to be a conflict between Germany and England and England's going to have to save the day. And I remember being noticing it because I couldn't remember the time. I was like, Ooh, how prescient was that? But then I had to remind myself she's writing. So it wasn't as prescient as, I mean, so if I had, I wrote notes and I may have a, a note on that passage, but I'd have to go back and look at my notes from the previous volumes. But I mean, that's my recollection. I could be wrong, but I think there was one section where, and I, I'm guessing it was Michael, but it also could have been in that scene where the, um, the they're talking to the, um, the couple in the hotel room and um, it could have been that guy too. Yeah, I think also this is where George Thompson has a, was a wonderful resource because there are several uh, sort of books of philosophy about politics uh, and predictions about where the world is going that Miriam uh, refers to, uh, if not, she doesn't name the titles in most cases, and, and Thompson 
digs up what what those texts are and and you know they are the sort of books that i have to say that they don't last very long because <laughs> you know this is the way the world's going to play out uh and uh you know there there were lots of visions about how the various combinations of the grand alliance were going to uh, team together um uh, Okay, the, uh, he's a Hungarian patriot. Yeah, that's uh, I and I can't think of the character's name, but it is based on a real person who wrote a, a book uh, that Miriam does refer to about his vision of what's going to happen um, in Europe. Be worth the, if, if I can dig it up. I'll I'll, I'll see if I can uh, yeah. dig up that reference. That, that still aligns, doesn't it? Insofar as Yes, Miriam experienced people expressing all kinds of views, some of which turned out to be more prescient than others, but that I'm, I'm imagining this wasn't, you know, you can imagine how a narrative, another kind of narrative might, I, I mean, I haven't looked at that passage maybe, but how, how another narrative might might pause and dwell and, and allow a kind of, you know, aura to develop around that sentence, which I imagine, I very much imagine she doesn't. Um, right, no, I agree. And because I think her project is as, several people have said in the chat is much more, I mean, I, I agree like with, with what you were saying in terms of, I admire her um, artistic, uh, what did you, what word did you use, Brad, that um, she doesn't allow herself to do those kinds of things. She's very much focused on, here's a young girl trying to figure out where to go in life, and this is what she sees, and and how she makes those decisions is kind of her project. How how is she going to live her life? And, you know, so almost that it's like a roadmap for other young people, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I do think, and I've said this a number of times, I think this is such a, you know, of a, of a book that people can get so much information and so much, so many thoughts about the decisions you make, particularly as a young person, shaping, deciding, which path you want to take into the future and which way of living uh, works for you. And I think particularly now, because we do see so many young people exploring options that, you know, 40 years ago, my generation would have thought, well, that's kind of eh, not, it's a little on the edge, maybe not socially acceptable. And they're kind of diving into a headlong now. So uh, I feel like pilgrimage speaks that, to that kind of the, the young individual who is saying, I'm not going to pick something off the set menu. Mm -hmm. it, it's, but but it's, it's one of the wonderful paradoxes and one of, one of the reasons I love literature like this. And I, I mean, another contemporary literature as well that is that somehow manages to, um, it, it's incredibly specific, like insist, as we said, insistently specific. It doesn't even, it, there's a load of stuff in here that you have to look up. You don't know what she's referring, you know, all of this stuff about that, that is more than a hundred years old. She's not gonna explain to you, it is ju it's just Miriam. And yet in the process of being as absolutely specific as she can, this, these, these, what, you know, there's something that, I get, I'm gonna, I don't wanna say relate to because one of my bugbears, but there, there, there offers something that is, that is, that kind of can speak quite profoundly across those differences, but it's through the precision of it, somehow through the detail, it's, it's a, a sort of interesting paradox to me about that kind of writing. Yeah, yeah that's a great perspective. The, the specificity that is so intrinsic to this book. Uh, and, and that's too, I mean, that's some of the things that we all, I think, in the course of reading it have come across passages where we just go, oh my gosh, that's exactly, that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> well, wonderful. Hey, this has been such a terrific discussion. And I want to thank you, Bryony, for, for joining us and, and uh, offering your own thoughts. And uh, I think we can all agree that uh, every time we've had one of uh, the Richardson, the family of Richardson scholars join us, we just, uh, to, to use a Miriam analogy, it is like opening up a new window. 
on a new Vista. So thank you so much uh, uh, for, for joining us. It's been a, a terrific discussion. And uh, just for those of you who have hung in, I hope you're finding it a worthwhile experience. We're over the hump, we're into volume four. So it's downhill from here. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, what we have to talk about in the remaining uh, months of engaging with this wonderful text. So Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you, Bryony, And uh, thank everyone for joining. It's been terrific. And uh, I will let everybody know when this is available up on YouTube, hopefully later today. Take care, Thanks everyone. So Thanks for inviting me, Brad. Thanks, everyone, for the discussion. It was really fantastic. Thank you.